Dr. Abby is with us from UH. And um, so next week is Thanksgiving. Yes, it is. So, is, and is there any like medical stuff we should be talking about as far as the holidays? Well, and, uh, yes. And Thanks. the weather? Yeah. Well, the weather's great, so I'm not going to complain well, about right, that. Right, right. <laughs> but it may not last. Um, well, for the holidays in general, Thanksgiving, Christmas, there are big eating holidays. So for those of us who may have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, it's going to be a little bit rough because lots of sweets. Lots mm -hmm. of salts, lots of carbs, those kinds of things. I'm not going to ask that people don't do it, but just be conscientious of what you're eating if you can. But do you recommend doing the plate where you have your plate and you have your portions of more vegetables, less? I've always told my patients, every time you set up a plate for yourself, the biggest portion should always be your vegetables. Okay. The second biggest portion should be your protein, and it should be lean meats, and there's only three, turkey, which is good because yep. it's Thanksgiving. Um, fish and chicken breast. Okay. Everything else is a red meat, so you don't need to worry. So never about eat those. Well, not never. Well, I never, never oh, say no. never. Okay. Um, I say you want to pick one night in your week where you want to go ahead and indulge. Then go ahead and indulge. That's fine. But as a routine thing, mm -hmm. those should be the three meats that you're sticking to. Because I find that when you tell human beings not to touch something, they're going to touch more it. Prone. <laughs> yeah. So um, that, and then your least biggest portion should be your um, carbs. And when you do eat carbs, I always tell them whole grain, whole grain, whole grain. Not whole wheat, not white. We're talking brown rice, whole grain pasta, um, you know, things mm -hmm. of that nature. And then one big mistake that we often make is I also tell them, please eat it in that order. So finish all your vegetables first. Now that's going to be hard to get into that routine. Then that is amazing. Because then by the time you get to the carbs, you may be full and you may not want to eat them. That is a great so, tip. So that's the other thing. I've never had a doctor ever tell me to do it that way. Yeah. Well, now you have. Now I have. So I got, I'm going to be honest, for Thanksgiving, I'm probably not good at that. <laughs> no, that's okay. Have your fun with the holidays, but then when we get back on routine after our yeah. New Year's resolutions and things like that. So with You never had a doctor tell you to get your plates renewed either. No, I did, but I got a ticket. So I need my doctor to tell me a little bit more, I guess, um, besides food and healthiness, but remind me of my plates. So with the desserts though, because you know the holidays, especially Thanksgiving, you're going to have the plethora of, I mean at most family right. settings, right. the dessert table. Right. So what is your recommendations to folks with diabetes? Because you know that's diabetics, especially at my facility, they go right to the sweets. Even though they know they're diabetic, they shouldn't be touching the sweets. Right. Is there, I hate to say it, is there a better sweet to eat like an apple pie opposed to a pumpkin pie or a pumpkin pie better to... Um, so, I know it's an awkward question. No, so one important concept, not just for diabetes, but also for weight gain, is this concept of what we call, there are two actually important concepts. One is glycemic index, and a lot of people don't know what that is. Glycemic index is not all carbs, not all sweets are the same. Okay. Um, when you when you eat them, glycemic index is how much is actually absorbed from your gastrointestinal tract and mm -hmm. turned into <clears throat> sugar in your blood and eventually fat if you don't use it. Okay. Um, so like I said, the whole grain type things and your complex carbohydrates, which are your fruit, fruit-based things, okay. um, they have a lower glycemic index. So more of it is excreted and less of it is absorbed really, really quickly and causes that huge... Um, rise in blood sugar. Refined carbs, so anything that comes out of boxes, packages, anything like that that's not made from flour that you're using yourself, okay. those have a much higher glycemic index. Okay. Um, anything that's canned, so like if you can use, if you're going to do for example cherry, if you can use an actual cherry rather than canned cherries, oh, okay. which have syrups in them and all that other stuff, Okay. and preservatives, those those things have a higher glycemic index. Okay, so if so opposed to going out and buying the Sara Lee pie. Yes. If you are talented you make it fresh. Make it fresh. Yes. Or purchase it fresh from a yes. bakery that you know is gonna have made it from scratch. There you go. Yeah. That's absolutely. a that's, that's a, a great big, thing. big difference. It makes a big difference. And that makes sense because you eat so, the whole thing. I wouldn't say mm -hmm. don't eat the whole thing folks. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll be seeing Dr. Abby <laughs> much sooner. Yeah, oh, you know, you know, <laughs> Portion control is a very, very important thing. I have a sweet tooth too, and I tell my patients that all the time. I cannot go to sleep at night without dessert. So what I do is just make sure that it's not a huge thing. You know, if it's like a piece of pie, it's like a half of what you would mm -hmm. consider a piece. Yes, just to satisfy that urge. So what you have to do, folks, is take a 
slither of each pie to make a whole mm -hmm. piece of pie, and then yeah. you can have yeah. That way you can try everything. You can try everything. And, and then and that works. You 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 know you realize that you're not really doing what you should do. So what you do then is you throw whipped cream on top of it so it covers up the evidence. You know, I don't, I don't like whipped cream, so more power to the whipped creamers out there. So Since we were on this topic, the other important thing that we often don't focus on is something called advanced glycation end products. Okay. Um, it's called AGE as an abbreviation, but um, basically when it's carbs, because when we talk about sugars, it's not just sugars. Carbs turn into sugars in our body for those of you who are diabetic. Um, when we're cooking carbs, let's say it's pasta. Okay. When you cook it for two too long, like you overcook it, beyond the point of when you're supposed to be eating it, um, then more of it becomes absor gets absorbed. Oh. If you cook it just to the oh. right point, like for example, if you take a potato, okay, a mashed potato is actually has a higher glycemic index than, for example, a scallop potato because a scallop oh. potato is cooked less. So the less you cook those carbs and eat them less of it gets turned into sugar in your body. Wow. Yeah, I noticed it. in Italy that they don't cook pasta as much as they do. You're not supposed to overcook it. Yeah. 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 It should not be well. breaking up in, on your plate. It should be pretty Firm. chewy. Yeah. 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 That's how it is. When I was in Italy as well, I didn't notice that. And I thought yeah. that, I thought maybe it was, you know, just the thing that they do, but maybe right. they're onto something. Cause yeah. I tell you what, I literally will check there. it like every minute or every two minutes and I'll be like, all right, it's just right. And I will stop it at that point. So. That's interesting. I just learned something amazing because I always overcook it. I do. Even yeah. my potatoes. I mean, I just, I'm, I do sweet potatoes. So okay. Potatoes Ooh. better than. Oh yeah, potatoes. they are, aren't they? I posted sweet it on potatoes. Facebook, so I'm, I'm asking a doctor now. Yes. I posted it. <laughs> sweet potatoes are better than, um, regular potatoes. They have a little bit more complex carbohydrates in them than Wonderful. regular potatoes. So would it be best to state for folks maybe to do a sweet potato instead of a mashed potato? Yeah. Or, at Thanksgiving. Yeah. And, and again, like a scallop potato is better than a baked potato, which is better than a mashed potato because by the point that it's mashed, you've really cooked it. But you the scallop potato is people tend to put cheese in it and that kind of stuff is not yeah. good for you. I mean, there are other ways. You can do garlic scallop potato. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like that, With a little so. rosemary and yeah. some... Yeah, I, I, I don't do, would be good, yeah. yeah. I don't, I, when I make my scallops, I don't do the cheese. I do, yeah. an, I do an olive oil base, which is probably not I find. Good. Olive oil is probably the best oil to use, okay. so it's probably better than the cheese or butter that you. Oh, okay. Like then I'm doing it okay. Yeah, with the the seasoning and the garlic, I find the garlic scalloped potatoes. They're delicious. Good. With a little yeah. bit of uh, rosemary and thyme. And yeah, we can sing a Simon and Garfunkel song. Here, here, we, here we go again. No, no. It's all downhill this morning. Good luck. Is, are you going to Scarborough Fair? Yeah, that's anyway. anyway. And we're moving it's, on. Okay. All right. <laughs> White bread, white, does that have any nutritional value to it? Okay, so, it's funny you bring this up, I'm like, this is my area, so, <laughs> um, carbs in general, okay, uh, don't have a great degree of nutritional value. Um, fruits and vegetables are important because they have your vitamins and minerals. Protein is, uh, meats are important, they're very important because they have your proteins. Carbs really give you nothing more than energy. So if you're not expending all that energy that you're taking in, then they really are not doing anything for so, you. So if you were living in the 19th century and you're out there baling hay and chopping wood and plowing then you'd be lower using 40, a lot more then that's, that's right. a good time to have right. the carbs. But even then, not white bread. White bread <laughs> is a no-no. It does not exist in my house. So you go either the... I mean, if you, some folks, they have to have white bread, you know, like they were grow, right. grown up with the white bread. Right. So what would be the bread next that would be like an easy transition for them to get to the whole grain? For me, rye. Okay. Um, to me, rye and whole grain are pretty mm. much equivalent. Like well, I like rye. If you turn it around and you look at the carb content, mm -hmm. rye and whole grain have the least. Okay. Whole wheat and white have the most. Um, for me, I honestly, I use rye, I put my turkey meat in there, my cheese in there, and then I stick it in the panini maker, and it comes out real so well. So rye, so. rye, yeah. rye, okay, I'll try that. I've never, I'm not a big rye fan, but you I... should try it. I'll have to try it. I usually do whole grain or wheat. Try it, start not with... wheat, stay away from whole grain. Oh, okay, wheat. see? Yeah. Start with rye humor, no and after you get into the rye humor, then maybe you can segue into the rye bread. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, folks. Don't just sit here. <laughs> that was cute, though. I like that. I got, it took me a minute, actually. Like, I, I, I processing. Started processing. Yeah, I was like, I know this. Is, she she this, started to get it. She started. She this got is going to go downhill real fast. This is what my brain was saying at first. And then as I kicked the words in, I was like, yeah, that yeah. is bad. So, 
Um, my other quick question after. Yay, yay. Um, what would you what would you tell folks for nutrition to substitute for because kids are carbs. I mean, kids right. love the the cheaps or the chips and the cheez its and all of oh, that. Oh yes, they you do. You know, like quick quick easy grab food. So. Right. For a parent on the go, yes. what would you recommend for them instead of putting the bag of Cheez-Its or the bag of chips in the back seat with the kids, what would be a good, a better substitute for them? If you can get them to eat it, things like carrots, um, you guys are not going to like this, but I grew up on Brussels sprouts. Oh, I, like I just got used to it, but most I people like Brussels hate sprouts. Brussels sprouts. <laughs> So my mom would just, there wouldn't be anything else. I'd be sitting there in front of the TV and she'd stick a bowl of Brussels that's, sprouts. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so I'm, I'm well, a healthy... How about person. asparagus? You like asparagus? Yes, I like asparagus. Um, But carrots, because you don't have to cook them or anything. You okay. just have to yeah. wash them. So if you can give them like a bag of... And, and they're pretty tasty. Um, What children seem to like, it, it just seems to be a thing that you have to get them started on it. Okay. For example, juices. We used to think, oh yes, let's give our children apple juice and orange juice, and now that's a big no-no. And once they get a taste of that at a very young age, you know, a lot of foods are, are linked to memories and, and like mm -hmm. feelings and things mm -hmm. like that. So once you get them started on those sweet things that they used to have when they were kids, they kind of never grow out of it. Okay. So staying away from juices, sweets, you know, lollipops, those kinds of things, and maybe just getting them into the culture of having vegetables. And um, if you could do something with meat, uh, like little sausage fingers or something like that, protein's really, really good, good. for them. Okay. Cheese is not a bad thing, like as long as it's not an excess. So like a cheese stick or something that's cut up or something like okay. that, celery, those kinds of things. So for, for a parent on the go, um, maybe a small bag of carrots with yeah. a, a string cheese. And yeah. so they have a little bit of a variety. Yeah. And then um, wh how, what's your take on the um, celery with peanut butter? I was going to say, I was like, that might be a good way to spice it up for kids. Okay. We used to eat it, we call it ants on a log. Yep, with we, little raisins. With raisins yep. on it. So, yes, peanut butter is good, again, in moderation. Okay. So, if it's just on a couple sticks of celery, that's totally fine, and, and kids will take to that a lot better than just basic celery. So, I got two kids, grandkids that are allergic to peanut butter, like swelling up and stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. Put Nutella on it. I don't know how it'll do but you can try. <laughs> And on the next show, we'll see how Robert's That's children reacted to Nutella. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, is there a better, because you're seeing in moderation with peanut butter, right. is there a better peanut butter than a post that, like, we grew up on Jeff, but okay. now when you go down the peanut butter section aisle, there is all, like, you have the all natural, all organic, low sodium. I mean, is there really a better peanut butter? Low fat, low Plus, fat, low fat, um... Crunchy is what I like. Yeah, I mean, is that so? Put it on a bagel. Let me start with the low fat. Okay. I I know it's not really low fat, right? I am Ugh. not a proponent of low fat anything. Okay. And I tell my patients very, very much, anytime it says zero sugar added or no fat or zero calories and you're eating it and it tastes sweet to your tongue, that is not, and not that they don't have sugar in it, they have chemically synthesized, like lab synthesized sugar in it. Okay. Which actually your body is less able to metabolize than regular sugar. Wow. And they're not able to convert that to calories, like, so they don't convert it to calories and they don't report it as calories, but I always tell them, none of this zero sugar, none of this Splenda, none of that stuff. Raw cane sugar, but in much smaller proportions is what wow. we need to do. So no, like the fat-free dressings as you're... I don't do any of that. So oh. for example, if you take, for example... They if you taste take, awful. Well, that. <laughs> if, you, if you take, for example, milk. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm a full... 100% full fat milk drinker. Okay. Not 2%, not skim, not any of that. So if you turn each of those um, cartons around, the 2% milk will have a great, a lesser amount of fat, but a greater, greater amount of carbs. Because as soon as they extract the fat, they throw sugar in there. Oh. Because otherwise you have no taste to it. So as skim milk has even more carbs and less fat, and then 2% has like more, and then full fat milk just has normal milk fat, but it doesn't have as much sugar in it, except the natural sugar. So drink the whole, but drink less of it. Yes. So I drink a half a glass of whole milk every night. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to try it. I've never drank whole milk. I don't drink any milk. Of. I can't stand milk. Oh, but that's all right. A little soy <laughs> milk on cereal. So, yeah. so a half a glass, is that what you're saying daily? To that is my daily intake. Okay. Um, you know, usually they say one... one for kids, two, three glasses of milk when they're growing. Um, for an adult, I would say one glass of milk if it's going to be 2%. But I just, I drink a half a glass of whole milk. Okay. How about for yeah. a cat? <laughs> <laughs> 
Once again, <laughs> so down now. Um, okay, so I interrupted you on the peanut butter. So oh, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Just because I'm, I'm curious about the peanut butter because my mom and I have this debate every time we buy peanut butter. Right. She's like, you should go organic. And I'm like, but I don't think there's a difference. So, I mean, pe anything to me that is canned is... It has preservatives in it. There's no way of us getting around it. Um, the ones that say all natural, there's probably less oils and things added okay. to it. So I would go with that. Honestly, if I had the time and I knew how, I would make peanut butter myself. I was wondering it's that. always that. That's always there, the best There way. used to be a bulk store. It was started in King, North Kingsville to Kingsville. And Better in bulk. Yeah, and they would... They would just get out peanuts and grind them all up. And, that's the way and I now, like to. They're not around, but yeah. I think there's a place in Austinburg bulk place now you get off on 45 because the so. more you're eating things that have an expiration date like a year later mm -hmm. the more preservatives there are in them and the more you know there's all this talk about the more they're causing cancer and obesity crisis because of all yeah. of that I, stuff I, so I, I can't remember sense. what it was but it was something that there was a recall on and it said with the recall was for all of this item that with an expiration date of February 2017. Wow. <laughs> oh. So that so you should really look at your I know cuz people like to buy in bulk with an ex, you know an extended right. expiration but really you shouldn't. I mean you should buy you fresh Right. And, and kind of just go out there and do more shopping more often. Right. And I always tell my patients, I'm like, it's mostly, I obviously can't teach them about every single food out there, but I'm like, it's mostly common sense. Like, if there is canned tuna fish, for example, mm -hmm. if I want to make tuna casserole, I just get the tuna fillets that are in the freezer. Because oh, if yeah. you think about it, if you took out one of those tuna fillets out of your freezer and you set it on your counter, for t it wouldn't even last two days. It's right. Bad. So if that can has been sitting out there for six months, Imagine how many chemicals have to be in there to preserve that. That, you know, I never, I mean, I guess it is common sense, but right. I guess you don't really think about it because we're so prone to, to longevity the quick and, and quick yes. and easy. Yes. And, um, and it's because I know everyone's so busy, but right. if you just take a little bit of time. Right. So w are you an advocate then to prepare small meals, freeze them? That's totally fine. Okay. That's totally fine. Keep in mind that some things though, for example, um, uh, vegetables. Mm -hmm. When you change the temperature, when it's not as fresh and you change the temperature, you kind of kill away some of those minerals oh, that you might get. Okay. Um, so I don't buy frozen vegetables. I buy them fresh. I cook them. But like, if you put them in the fridge within the week, if you can finish them, that's okay. usually pretty be good. good. Oh, okay. Yeah. And don't cook them like crazy because then you're killing away all the minerals. Okay. So, um, you know, with Brussels sprouts, broccoli, asparagus, whatever, just until the point where I'm like, oh, okay, this is edible now and then I stop. My fiance, when I cook the vegetables, I like I like a mushy, but now I'm gonna have to train my body to yeah. not like a mushy because now I'm finding out mushy is at that point you're really getting fiber. Oh okay. yeah, you're getting nothing. He likes them crunchy, and he right. and he always says to me, if they're not crunchy, they're not good for you. And I always yeah. thought he was being crazy, and I'm like, who talks like he's about crazy that? about everything else? Well, he's with me. I mean, there's yeah, got to be some component of sanity. But um, so that's something that now he'll be so happy. I'll be like, Doc, Dr. Abby agreed with you that yeah. I have to leave him crunchy, and he'll probably love you now because he hates <laughs> mushy vegetables. <laughs> you, know. you, you talk about, you come back to protein once in a while and, and meat and whatever. And for those of us that don't eat meat, what, what do you suggest? Um, things <laughs> like, I don't know if you're a tofu lover. Oh, so, I, I eat it. Yeah. Okay, so tofu. Um, tofu is good. Anything that's milk based, so yogurt, cheese, milk, all has a, a good amount of protein in it. Nuts. Of any kind. How about chickpeas? I like chickpeas. Chickpeas have protein in them. I don't know if you like hummus. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of I Arabic don't know the friends. Words, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a lot of Arabic friends, so we do a lot of hummus. And um, yeah, so any of those lentil type things okay. beans, chickpeas, all that kind of stuff, nuts. Now, I'm, um, you may not know this about me because I don't talk that I cook, but I actually make a great hummus. Oh, you do? I do. Yes, I, I have do. to try it sometimes. Uh, I will have to make it. I put, I put fresh onion, garlic, oh, oh, and good. red pepper, because the red pepper gives it a little bit of a sweet. Yeah. Blend it all up. Then you just put a little bit of the, um, I put a little bit of the chopped up red pepper on top, and then that's like, it's like a dip. Oh, wow. I eat a lot of, I, sometimes, when I make it, I... Do you I, have an Arabic background? No. Okay. I, I just, um... I learned it. Well, I have a friend who's Arabic, and he was always like, oh, you got to try hummus. you got to try hummus. And I was like, oh, it doesn't even 
look good. I'm like, I'm not trying you, that. You saw Lawrence of Arabia once, right? No, like, and, no and, I would do, and I would do like the, um, you know, salsa and, you know, all those dips. And he's like, I'm telling you, you've got to try hummus. Yeah. And I'm like, you make it and I'll try it. So yeah. he made a batch up of this now hummus that I make. Right. And I fell in love with it. And wow. so he gave me the, I mean, it's quick, it's easy. All you need is a food processor. Right. right. Bada bing, bada boom. And so now, wow. it was one of my friends. Really? Yeah. And so every time he calls me, he's like, so have you had hummus lately? <laughs> but he, he does all different kinds of blends. I mean, he's just amazing. I'm right. Not, he's very talented. But So that's how I fell in love with hummus. Wow. Yeah, so. yeah I love it. And yeah. it's very healthy for you. Mm -hmm. dip, so. Now, if, like for with me, when I make my hummus, I tend to overgo. I like eat a little bit too much probably. Is yeah. there too much on hummus because there is, of the content? You, yes, you are putting oil and okay. butter and things like yep. that in there, so th there is always a too much. Okay. So it, it's just a good, healthier option than maybe eating like a cheese dip or something okay. like that. Um, but yes, there is it. Okay. Yeah. I'm, you can overeat. I don't everything. even need to make a doctor's can, appointment. I'm just right. asking her. I'm not like taking you notes. Wait till you see her bill. <laughs> I know. So that was like 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm just going to slide it right well, on over right. <laughs> We, You want to talk a little bit about like... Um, infections. Infections and that sort of thing. So how about if we take a break now and we'll no, come back good. and talk about that. We are back with Dr. Abby. We've been talking about food and how to spoil your holiday. But... Uh, Oh, no, I know. It's you, Dr. Abby said, you can indulge, but then you got to get refocused again. Right. right. Exactly. Not indulge like eat the whole pie. Right. Like Rob said, don't do that. It's, eat, eat a little portion. But we were also, we wanted to talk about, and it's at some point it's going to get cold out. <laughs> and then when you're in a building with a bunch of people, you hear a lot of coughing and sniffling and hacking and all that kind of stuff from everybody, especially me. So, infections, antibiotics, people then they want to go to the doctor and they want antibiotics and the doctor is not earning his or her pay without a sign, without giving you a prescription. Right. Um, so, this is a big, big problem that's happening, like bigger than all of us that we can't see right now, but mm -hmm. the CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control, right. has really been following this. We give out way too many antibiotics. Um, the number of, so... <clears throat> What happens with a bacteria is um, when it gets exposed to an antibiotic over and over again, it kind of like the flu virus, it can also change its composition to the point where it is now resistant to that antibiotic. So there's a very limited number of antibiotics that we actually have that have been created. So this is what you call building up a resistance? Yes, yeah. this is what you call building up a resistance. So what happens is most of the patients who walk into my office obviously have a head cold or something like that. But there are more serious illnesses that they can also end up with as they age. So you can end up in the ICU with sepsis. Right. Um, our big worry is that with all these antibiotics floating around, not only can you form resistance to any bacteria that's in you, but you can transfer that resistant bacteria to the people around you. Mm. So, oh. right. So a lot of people can become resistant at that point. And if, God forbid, <laughs> you were to end up with something like sepsis and end up in the ICU, you may have what we call a superbug to the point where we don't have an antibiotic to treat you anymore. Nothing's going to work. Wow. So not even like the Cubicins, the high-cost antibiotics that are out there? We just came out with those, but once those are used up as well, we don't really have anything else. Wow, because at the at my facility, right. we see a lot of folks that have gotten have become sepsis, and right. they come in and they have the Coumadin. Right, and it just seems like that is more of a antibiotic that I'm seeing more frequently now. That's only going to last for a while. Wow. <laughs> because you get sick again, and you don't have anything to give. Right, on. because if you look at the rate, our ra the rate of resistance is growing much more rapidly than the rate at which we're coming out with antibiotics with, um, anymore. That's very so, scary. Because um, so that's what I tell my patients. 80% of the people who walk into the clinic, uh, I mean, I mean, if you have a UTI, you have a urinary tract infection, but most of the URIs, the upper respiratory tract infections that come in, they're viral, okay? You caught them, you know, if you're not having fever and chills, you're not having green stuff coming out of your nose or coughing up green stuff or things like that, an antibiotic is not going to help. Most of it is that when the weather gets cold outside, our body is trying to protect ourselves, so our nasal passages and our breathing our airway start to produce more mucus and most of it is mucus in here and mucus in here and that's what it is 
So our main goal in that situation, because if you leave the mucus in there, anytime there's fluid that's sta like just staying right there, it will eventually get infected. Mm -hmm. But at that point, our main goal is to break up all that mucus and get it all out. Because if we get it all out, they'll feel a lot better. It's just about symptom relief. Um, so it's very important that we don't overuse those antibiotics. And so what do you do? Tell them to drink a lot of water? Or? No, I actually highly recommend Mucinex. Um, oh. There is a high dose, 600 milligram. You know, um, basically the generic is guanificin. It's in a lot of things, but um, Mucinex is pure guanificin. Um, like I said, it's the, high, it's the 600 milligrams that I found works the best. So that chemically breaks up all the phlegm. Um, you can also use an antihistamine like Zyrtec or anything like that because that prevents you from making more mucus. Okay. Um, and then one thing I like to use, which is a little bit old school, is to take a big, huge pot of water, boil it, oh. throw a spoon of Vicks in there, um, and then hold a towel over your head and allow that to go through your nasal pa passage and physically break up the, now, the wow. pot. When you do that the next time, could you have somebody take a picture of that so we can see it with the towel over your head? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so can I, this is, um, the, this is an old... But that, that's, that's like something when I was a kid, my mother would like put a, yep, a diaper yeah. over my neck with, with that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, my, my great-grandmother, um, she'd always say like if we started getting that respiratory, right? she'd always say, I'm going to do my, you got to get the fix out. And... She'd always rub it on the bottoms of our feet and then put socks. Right. And then she'd have us go to bed. And yeah. the next morning, I feel like 100% better. And I'm like, my grandma, my great grandma knew yeah. everything. But is that is that just something that just I don't know what the down? bottom of your feet. I know that we do it like it right at our nose, and then we do it at the throat and the chest and yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, the bottom of the feet. I mean, I could get absorbed into your body. I don't know. Your she, blood but I'm telling you, she's. What, and as I grew up, I said, you know, I do the Vicks everywhere, right. and I would feel mildly better. And one day, my mom says to me, "Do your feet like your great grandmother?" And then I said, "My feet. Oh yeah, I remember that." And then I do it, and my it worked. It I don't worked. know why it worked. Yeah. I just thought I it asked, works. Like, don't. I know a lot of the time it's just taking care of the symptoms and you feel better. There's no need for having gone to the doctor and gotten that antibiotic. I am. Um, I am. Um, I try to avoid. I'm yes. Sorry. I try mm -hmm. to avoid going no. to the doctor. <laughs> I agree. But um, it does seem like doctors are like I have a, a, a severe sinus infection that I'm bringing right. now through my second course of antibiotics. Right. And I know that I have to because it's an infection, but it just seems like doctors are more prone to just do the antibiotic. Is yes. that because they feel pressure by the patient to do it? Because I was, I was the patient that when I was in my doctor's office, I said, I would prefer not to do an antibiotic. Right. And he kind of wasn't taken aback by it. Right. And he's like, well, for this you do. So is it doctors feel pressure to do antibiotic? Or is it... I would say 80% of the time a physician does it because they're pressured by the patient to physicians don't I mean that's not the way we were taught yeah um, I mean if you need it you need it and if I know that a patient needs an antibiotic mm -hmm. I tell them I'm like I will push it on them because okay. I'll say otherwise this is going to turn into a big big infection um but most of the time 80% of the time they don't need it and they just we give it to them because I'm not gonna say we because I will say doctors argue yeah. but um doctors in general will give it to them because it's just quicker and patients are going to that's a great doctor. He well, gave me a it's WebMD. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna be honest. Like okay. WebMD, I self-diagnose constantly from WebMD, and I know I shouldn't. And I work in a nursing home, so if the patients come to me and they say I'm not feeling well, I'm like, well, let's run some labs. We'll have your right. doctor look into it. Right. I always refer them to the doctor, but for me, I'm like, oh, WebMD, and I'm like, I I'm dying. I have like you know this. Right. And we, Asian we, tropical flu that I couldn't only got if I traveled. Exactly. But I have it. We we tend to do that a little bit. We tend to, especially when you know all the diseases that are out there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more common for me to freak out and be like, "Oh my God, I have a lymph node. Yeah. I must have cancer." <laughs> so, but so I guess the, the the rule that we should implore to those listening and watching is, is that uh, if your doctor says you don't need an antibiotic. Please don't push them. Don't push them. Yeah. If they, if you need one, they will definitely push it on you. So. Yeah. I know some. What about all these commercials about drugs for heartburn or whatever? Do you get a lot of people that say I'd like the purple pill or whatever? So. Do you get Do you get a lot of that because they hear the advertising? So heartburn is a thing that actually it's a big deal because when we think of heartburn, we think oh it's a benign condition, it's just a symptom, that's it, but. 
heartburn has asso been associated very recently um, with a lot of esophageal cancer. So oh. it is the precursor to getting cancer of the esophagus. So heartburn is one of those symptoms that if you have it, it needs to be treated because we have to suppress the acid going back up into your esophagus, otherwise you'll end up with cancer. Wow. So that is actually one of those things where, no, if you're having symptoms, you need treatment. So if, see if, um, wow, that makes me scared, because my fiance every morning has yes. to take, Prilosa. yes, yeah. every morning, or he has severe heart, I mean, it's like, breathtaking some days for him. Right. So he, I should probably have him go see a doctor. Yes, because really that, that Prilosec is for eight weeks. And then if after eight weeks you're not feeling better, then you need to be scoped. Oh. Yeah. So folks at home, if you're taking that little pill for heartburn every day, you need to go see a doctor. Because yeah. that's very serious. I did not realize yes. that it was an, it's only an eight day course of treatment. Eight, week. eight, eight weeks. Because yes. on the packaging it says take daily. It does take daily, but that's why the doctor's supposed to tell you, well, we're going to try this and see if, you know, you get better over the next eight weeks. But if you come off of it and you're getting your heartburn still, then you, you need to be scoped. Okay. Yeah, because it's for dyspepsia. It's kind of a temporary treatment. Now, some people have been scoped and they have hiatal hernias and this and that where they're going to be on it lifelong, and that we understand. It's already been looked at. Mm -hmm. But if you're one of those people who's either you're older, there's a certain age group, um, you know, you're choking on food, you're losing wow. weight, if you have any of those what we call alarm symptoms, then you need to be scoped regardless. Or if the PPI isn't really alleviating the symptoms, then you need to be scoped. Okay. So. I'll be calling a, maybe Dr. Abby too. Because <laughs> he takes yeah. it every day. He's taking it eight years that I've been well, with him. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I've took it for a month and I got off of it and I... Yeah. And, the heart and you feel better? It no, I came back. back, yeah. Yeah. So you need to go get scoped. It's good to get an endoscopy at least once so they can see what's going on down there. Hmm. Yeah. Can I ask another question? Yeah. And this is on the opposite side. Uh, what is the age for a man to get a colonoscopy? Like, what is the recommended? Because they're changing, like... The screening patterns now, like for women for breast cancer, right. they're saying you can prolong it longer than, so, I mean, I know that's probably something that, so for men and women for colonoscopy, it's 50 if you don't have a, an underlying condition that predisposes you to colon cancer, okay. which includes things such as Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, those kinds of things, okay. or you don't have a first degree family member who had colon cancer. Oh. If you have a first degree family member who had colon cancer, then you have to be sc screened starting at 40 or 10 years before they were diagnosed. Wow. Whoa. So if they were diagnosed at 35, then you need to start screening at 25. Wow. I'm glad I asked that question. Yeah. So what about, because it's been, I mean, um, it's been in the news lately about how doctor, the recommendation had just come down that for breast cancer screening, right. it, you can postpone it now. But I have friends that are in their 30s that actually had breast cancer, and here I'm going, so should I go get my mammogram at 35, or do I wait now even longer than the original? So currently we're at 40 to 50. Right. Um, if my patients are concerned, you know, I will start at 40. Okay. Um, at 35, you're going to have a hard time convincing insurance companies that you... <laughs> to pay. Yes. That and that's the, that. that was the thing, because my girlfriend was just diagnosed, and it, it now it's to the point where she's going to have to have major cosmetic surgery. Right. Because she has to have, you know, unfortunately chemo. Did she have a family history? She didn't. Okay. And that was the How thing. How old was she? She's 35. That's and that, unfortunate. And she wouldn't have gotten <clears throat> And that was the thing, because she kept saying to her doctor, um, you know, I just feel like I need to get, and there was no lumps, she couldn't feel any lumps. So how did they end up screening? She Why ended up finding, uh, the doctor, her, her gynecologist um, actually kind of gave into her, because every time she would go, she'd just be like something, and she just kept saying, you know, there were certain sensations happening and things going on, that, but she didn't feel any lumps, and he kept saying to her, I don't see, I don't feel anything, I don't feel yeah. anything. And it was um, a year after the fact she started noticing like the sensation change and the um, coloration, things like that, that finally he went in and he said, okay, fine, I'll, we'll do it. But right. it was, you know, like her pressing him right. constantly. Right. Um, so I don't know if like, should I try just to have, I mean, if you could get a doctor and an insurance to okay it, I mean, it doesn't hurt. No, it doesn't hurt. At 35. No, it doesn't. Fine. It doesn't. Um, or if you feel like you're having some symptoms, it can always be, um, you can always get it as a diagnostic okay. uh, ultrasound of the breast or something, mm -hmm. um, rather than a screening if they don't accept it as screening. Okay. You know, I just, there are ways to get around it. It just seems like it's, um, cancer is developing more and younger right. than in, 
you know, more of the older population. Right. So just to be more, I think, proactive. Right. I know with the, all the new changes on screenings, right. it's going to be a lot harder for younger folks like myself who right. want to stay ahead of the game to but do so. It's not covered. Yeah. yeah. It, it's very unfortunate because these guidelines that we have and these ages that we have, they're very arbitrary. Well, I shouldn't say they're arbitrary. They're based on you know, 90% of the population get cancer during this period of time. For example, we stop mammograms after 75. doesn't mean you can't get breast cancer after 75. But, right. You know, it stops after that. So those are sort of the guidelines, and unfortunately insurance companies do follow mm. by those guidelines, yeah. But um, which means you're going to miss a case here and there. And yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. That's, that's not good is that if the, the insurance companies control all of this and it's because of profits and all it's just doesn't that question is above my pay grade <laughs> but we've had doctors on here before saying talking about that sort of yeah. thing and i've talked to the doc or i've talked to the insurance company and the worst thing is that these people have no medical you know training at all uh, insurances though they they have to look at, and this is going to sound horrible, because I deal with insurances on a daily basis. You you have to look at the ratio of input resources to exponent, or ex, you know, the exiting of re resources. So you can't give, if you're a patient or person and you just want to have all these tests done, just to have them done before their screen date, before their little, right. you know, mm -hmm. then they're losing more money. So then in the end, if you need it or a patient needs it, there won't be any money there because they've done this fluff filler that with giving you everything that you need. Well, I, I can see yeah. that, but there are instances... I'm trying not to get too political here so the right. phone doesn't but, light but there up. Are like, there, there's this, there is a, there is an actual formula of why tr insurances do what insurances do. And not that I'm condoning it, but it, there is I, a yeah, I can see what you're saying, but the question then also begs is, should health insurance and the health industry be a for-profit thing for, you know, the insurance companies. Once again, I don't want that phone lighting up, but you have, <laughs> you, you can always talk to your doctor and the best thing is just know your body, I think is what we've learned right. from this. Know your body and if it doesn't feel right, then you just either, one, continue to talk to your doctor and Right. After, if it was me, but maybe you should be talking to your insurance company, not your doctor. Well, but well, if the insurance company does, den I have been denied certain tests for my patients and things like that. They do have what's called a peer-to-peer, -peer, mm -hmm. where we call and we talk to a doctor on All the right, side. All right, so that's good. And we do say, like, this is what I'm seeing, and I really, you know, yeah. need you to do this. And I've told them on the phone, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to send them to the emergency room to get it done because then you can't deny it. They can't deny it. I mean, there are, there are um, and that's when I advise, I, I advise family members and patients, like when they come in for a total knee or a total um, hip and they're on an HMO or PPO and they're denied after only seven days and they still can't ambulate independently and they have to go home by themselves. I always say, let's do a peer-to-peer. -peer. And if you have a good doctor, they're going to be willing to do that. Now, here's, They should be doing that. Yeah, always. on the flip side, if you have a doctor who says, I don't have time or I'm not doing that, just time go home with doctor. Them, time to get a new doctor. Yeah. And I've, I've recommended that to patients. Because that is part of a doctor's job description. Absolutely. Is if you truly think a patient needs a test and it's denied by the insurance company, you need to get on the phone and yeah. do that. And I've, there are some doctors that won't, they just won't, I don't know why, I'm not that doctor, but then I'll tell, the family's like, well, they wouldn't even do the peer-to-peer, the -peer, and I'm like, then it's time to find a different yeah, doctor. that's a little unfortunate. Yeah. And they're overwhelmed. I mean, doctors are overwhelmed. Yeah, right. So, right. But they got to be time for that. Yeah. yeah. I have to make You're time. your patient's advocate. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I want to get past the insurance question because I'm very Everything confused on this. Because so I'm like, we're, we're encroaching on the end. We are. Yeah. And he did, you know, we did pretty well today, folks. We had a few slide downwards, but we, re yeah, we, right. we rallied. We rallied. And thank you for pointing them out. I, you're welcome. It's okay. <laughs> you know, and, hey, it didn't change. Right. Like when Pat was on the show, I did the same thing. Yeah. So, see, we kept, we kept the activity moving mm -hmm. there. So, wonderful. Well, thank you for coming right. on. Thank, thank you for, for coming in. Me. Dr. Abby, we will be back in a moment.